Good afternoon, this is Dean McClure with TTL. Um, and we are excited to have each of you join us for the TTL Insights uh, virtual event, our first one. And um, this is here by request of you, our clients. And uh, we look forward to doing some more of these. We can also bring these to your location uh, if you so desire and do them with your staff or your team as needed. Um, TTL founded in 1964, is an engineering design firm focused on providing infrastructure solutions to public and private clients. Um, our team of over 450 team members provide civil engineering, transportation engineering, geotechnical engineering, environmental consulting, material testing and inspection and surveying services to a wide variety of clients across the South and South Central US. Um, safety is a priority with TTL. So I would like to begin with a safety moment. And you can probably hear in my background, I'm in a huge thunderstorm where I'm at right now, uh, going to the uh, ASCE meeting down on the coast. And so this is really a, a pretty timely safety meeting in the last two weeks, done a lot of uh, on the road travel and have experienced um, two events uh, while traveling down the interstate, going through great sunshine weather into a wall of water. Uh, and it was a little disconcerting um, about a lot of the traffic still proceeding at 70 to 80 miles per hour in the left-hand lane. And while a group of us were over in the right-hand lane dropped down to about 40 miles an hour. And um, one of the things I think we've got to be careful there is that obviously we've got um, some really elevated conditions for hydroplaning. Uh, more speed increases that risk. Uh, we also had some folks uh, that wanted to actually pull off the interstate and get on the shoulder, which I understand it was raining really, really hard, but that is really uh, a, not a very safe place to be because our sight distance is severely limited uh, as a driver, and we often are following tail lights and not the lines on the road because we can't see them, and people sometimes perceive that tail light as being in the roadway and not necessarily on the shoulder. So if you do feel like you need to pull off the roadway, try to find an exit or a, a place if you're along a four lane to be able to get completely off the roadway rather than just pulling on the shoulder during one of these events. Um, so that, that will conclude our safety moment. So uh, today it is my honor to introduce Cindy House Pearson uh, who will do the presentation today. She is a recognized expert and authority in the natural resource uh, space and arena. Uh, she has significant experience um, with delineation, jurisdictional determination, uh, permitting evaluations, and for the unfortunate few, uh, resolution to enforcement actions if you ever get uh, into that situation. Uh, Cindy has over 38 years of experience with the US Corps. Uh, she uh, served notably in two major positions with the Corps, being the Birmingham Branch Chief and also in the Mobile District uh, Regulatory Division Chief. And since 2014, uh, TTL has, uh, has been proud to have Cindy as a part of our team in helping uh, clients navigate the complex and dynamic environment of um, environmental regulations as they pertain to natural resources. Um, jurisdictional features are jurisdictional until they're not, and then they're jurisdictional again when a new administration comes in or a new EPA director comes in and determines that they are. So they are constantly evolving. Uh, Cindy's uh, aspiration is, to, and her interest is certainly to be able to keep appraised of those changing evalu um, evaluations and to look ahead into the future into what the core may be thinking or the EPA may be thinking as they go forward. So uh, she has helped uh, a broad array of clients navigate that complex environment and she has built a network of resources which she uses to be able to help her continue uh, helping clients as, as they navigate um, that, like I said, that very dynamic environment. So um, at the, uh, alongside this, there is a chat and you can certainly ask questions. We will do our best at the end, as time permits, to answer all those uh, during this and maybe offer a few moments for questions. Uh, I promise you we will get back to each and every one of you. If we don't have time to answer your question, 
online, we will get back to you and answer that question as a follow up. So I will go ahead and say, take it away, Cindy. Thank y'all again for joining us. Thank you so much, Dean. Um, and welcome everybody um, to this afternoon's meeting. We're gonna talk about Sackett um, two and Waters of the US. And I'm assuming that many of you already know that the Sackett case was a situation that um, the Mr. and Ms. Sackett had a violation. They were trying to build a home and the Corps of Engineers stopped them from building their home because they said they were impacting wetlands without a permit. And the Sacketts kept building. They kept filling the lot. Well, EPA stopped them um, after that. And it, this case has been to court for four, in court for 14 years. It finally wound up with the Supreme Court and has been there for a number of years as well. Well, we finally got a Supreme Court decision on this. So I'm gonna go over some of this with y'all. And this is what we're gonna look at, the current um, Biden wetland rule, which is no longer in play because of the Sackett decision. Um, of course, the Sackett decision came out from the Supreme Court on May 25th, 2023. The regulations have not been written yet, but we have the decision from the Supreme Court. Then definitions, um, project examples, showing you exactly what we think may be jurisdictional and may not, and then going forward with jurisdictional determinations with the core. So that's current information that I can share with you right now. Um, the 2022 rule is on hold in most states. So everything is rolled back to post 2015, which is essentially Rapanos, meaning significant nexus. Um, the Supreme Court declared significant nexus is not constitutional. So going forward, once we get the regulations from EPA and the Corps, we will no longer have to use the significant nexus determinations. Um, there are no other rules in place right now, and EPA and the Corps refuse to give any kind of guidance because, you know, they're working on new guidance. They don't want to say anything at all, and, and I try to keep my finger on that pulse the best I can. I have a lot of friends in those um, areas, and I've talked with the Corps in several districts. I've talked with EPA and they just will not share anything at all right now. So we'll have to wait. We're expecting something hopefully in September um, that will give us the new guidance. And keep in mind that this, we're not sharing any legal advice at all right now. Okay. Jurisdictional waters of the US. That is um, navigable waters, which include oceans, rivers, streams, wetlands, marshes, and have a continuous surface water connection. That's what we're looking at right now is what would be determined jurisdictional. Uh, EPA and the Corps, of course, like I said a while ago, is working on that, on the new rules. So hopefully we'll have something soon out of them. Okay, the Clean Water Act. In 1972, LBJ came up during his administration with the Clean Water Act, which essentially said there would be no more discharges of pollutants into waters of the U.S. Um, you know, and that, of course, was something we needed because the Cuyahoga River at that time was burning. So... Um, that was a good law, good rule, but they didn't give anybody any guidance on what to do. So the agencies were left to come up with the regulations. In 1986, they finally came out with the first Waters of the U.S. definition. Okay, you had the the Waters definition in '86 that said what you could regulate, what you shouldn't regulate, what required a permit, 
um, that sort of thing. And there has been many changes since that time. Um, in 1986, of course, we got the regulations printed. Then between 86 and 2015, we have had isolated wetland determination. We've had the Tulloch excavation rule determination. We've had sign significant nexus. Uh, we've also had Rapanos. And then of course, as the president's changed, Obama created his own rule and it was repealed, replaced. Then in 2019, that rule came back again. Then in 2020, Trump came in, he pinned his own rule that was replaced as soon as Biden came in. So it's just been topsy-turvy with the, the waters of the US uh, for a long, long time. And I hope that this new Supreme Court decision is going to make a difference for us. Okay, and in, in 2022, when Biden came into office, they went through rulemaking, and in 2021, they actually uh, put those the new regulations out for review by the public, and it's a 60-day review period. That was in December of 2021. February 2022 is when the, the um, 60 days was up. They received 115,000 comments. Now, can you imagine having to go through 115,000 comments? So it took them um, over a year to review those comments and respond. And the rule came into to place in March 20, 2023. So the rule had, the new rule had just started when the second rule um, decision was made in May. So there's going to be a whole new change to the regulations, but the 2023, March 2023 rule is no longer applicable. We've rolled back to Rapanos again. This is the announcement that EPA and the Corps placed on the website. Everybody, they have to do that to notify the public. Okay, 26 states um, and join the lawsuit with EPA's latest waters rule. At least five federal lawsuits filed challenge against the waters rule. So no, there were many, many groups that were against that waters rule. Um, the Supreme Court is not expected to stop those lawsuits. Okay. This is 2022 rule standards. This was under the Biden rule. This is, um, we're gonna talk about relatively permanent waters and significant nexus. The relatively permanent standard is that um, waters with a continuous surface water connection and standing or continuously surface water flowing waters connected to waters of, and waters of a continuous surface connection. That's very confusing. It refers to relatively permanent standing or continuously flowing waters that are connected to, have a surface water connection to such relatively permanent waters or traditional navigable waters. And, and what that means in plain language is, if you've got a stream and it has a surface water connection to a navigable water, it's jurisdictional. The significant nexus Can't, there, okay. The significant nexus um, is a terminology that they used in the previous regulations to show that if a water has a chemical, physical, or biological impact on the downstream flows to a traditional navigable water, then those wetlands above the traditional navigable water are considered jurisdictional. 
the Supreme Court actually said that was that will no longer be the case. So the traditional, the significant nexus will no longer be used, which makes a huge difference in determining what a wetland, what wetlands are jurisdictional. Okay. The Clean Water Act extends to wetlands that are, as a practical matter, indistinguishable from waters of the United States. So you see the stream and you see the tidally influenced wetlands adjacent to it, they are touching. So those wetlands are still jurisdictional. The water is jurisdictional because it, it is a stream that flows down into a section 10 waterway. The water body has to be connected to a traditional navigable water, which we just saw in the photograph above. And it must have a continuous surface connection to the water. And we are not sure right now what that continuous surface water connection is, but we're, we're gonna hopefully find that out soon. Um, there are three, during the court case, there were three issues with the Supreme Court. Um, the significant nexus determination, five of the justices agreed that that was unconstitutional. Um, there was one justice that felt like they should not make national environmental policy. And there were three that agreed with not adjacent. So in favor of the Sacketts, the Supreme Court was a nine to nothing. So they all agreed that the Sacketts case, which was a, I'll go back to what it was like. It was a wetland lot that was separated from the river by a berm and by a road there was no surface water connection. So they agreed that that lot should not be considered jurisdictional. Wetlands, the definition of wetlands is swamps, marshes, bogs, and similar areas. And those areas that are inundated or saturated long enough to support hydrophytic vegetation. This is a picture of a wetland swamp, of course, that everybody knows is a wetland because of, you know, the way it looks. The picture on the right hand side is a farm field and you can tell the difference in the vegetation. The area that has been cut and farmed is not wetlands because it's dry enough that they could get on it. The grassed area, of course, is probably a wetland. Now, whether that grassed area would be considered jurisdictional or not today is going to be one of the questions. It depends on if it actually abuts or connects to a water of the U.S. Adjacent is bordering, contiguous, or neighboring. And wetlands separated from other waters of the United States by man-made dikes, barriers, natural river berms, beach dunes, and the like are considered adjacent wetlands. Adjacency is not going to be regulated um, when, the, when the new term regulation comes out, or that's what everyone is thinking. This is an adjacent wetland. You see the tree line that runs around, and then you have an area to the left that is separated. That was an old oxbow that used to be part of that stream system, but is not any longer. In, in the old regulations, that would be considered jurisdictional because it is a, adjacent to that stream. However, adjacency is no longer gonna be regulated, so it will not be jurisdictional. Okay, this is, um, High tide line is the line that on the land that actually the 
tide reaches all the way up. You can see a rack line is the, the high tide line. It, it will show an oil scum, uh, indention area, debris, a berm, something of that nature that is going to show the high tide line. It's, it, in, it will not include a storm surge. It includes spring high tide, but it does not include a storm surge like during a hurricane or something of that nature. It's only something that happens annually like spring high tide or mean high tide or some of those situations. This is a great picture. It shows the tide line coming all the way up. You see the area that's actually dirt. And then you see the, the line where the vegetation starts. That's the high tide line. Ordinary high water mark is where the water fluctuates in a river system or stream system. You'll have impressions on the bank. You'll have shelving, um, soil characteristics destruction of terrestrial vegetation, um, litter and debris along the bank. This is a great picture as well. You can see where the, the ordinary high water goes um, between the soil and the vegetation. That's the ordinary high water mark. Um, Erdic, which is our, the Corps of Engineers, um, scientific, um, their scientific lab in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and they develop tools to work on, to work with the natural resource work that we do. Um, this is a field manual that they work up for ordinary high water mark, which will probably be used um, now since we've had so many changes, this is gonna be a good tool for us to use to help determine jurisdiction. Okay, um, we're going back into Trump's adjacent rule. The term adjacency means wetlands that abut, and that means they touch another water of the US, A1 water, which is A1 through three, which is uh, navigable waters, streams, and lakes. Now, are inundated by they're inundated by flooding from paragraph A one through three water in a typical year. Those are not going to be jurisdictional, and because it's flooding, so we're not looking at flooding. They have to be touching the water. And they are physically separated from these other waters by a berm, natural berm, bank, dune, or similar natural feature. This is what we don't know. Um, are they going to be jurisdictional if they have if they have a structure that will allow for a direct hydrologic surface connection? in a typical year through a culvert, flood, or tide gate, pump, or similar artificial feature. So if you've got a pond and there is a um, outfall structure that goes from the pond into a water of the US, is that gonna be a surface water connection? Or, or is it not gonna be jurisdictional? We don't know that answer yet. And an adjacent wetland in its entirety when a road or similar artificial feature severs connection as well. Um, you know, there could be culverts through the road. There could be an overflow situation. We don't know if those are going to be determined jurisdictional or not. I cannot see EPA and the Corps saying that they're not going to be jurisdictional, but we just don't know, don't know that answer. And wetlands that are, as a practical matter, indistinguishable from waters of the United States. That's what the Supreme Court says, that 
they have to be indistinguishable. So they essentially have to be touching. That's why there's a question as to whether or not a pipe or other man-made structures or berms or that sort of thing will be jurisdictional or not. Um, the Trump rule had flooding, whereas we figure that's probably going to wind up being one of the situations under the new rule that they will have to look at that uh, to keep from losing so many different features. Okay, these are features that were jurisdictional and not jurisdictional under the Trump rule. And if you will notice on the top there, that's, that's the flood zone. The red line is the flood zone. These are all lakes and ponds, which are inside the flood zone. They were all determined as jurisdictional because they would receive flood waters from this river, you know, as the river flooded. So that was considered that they that they sent um, downstream flows to to the chemical, physical, and biological um, content of the river. So actually, they provided assistance to this river, chemically, physically, and biologically. Okay, because they flooded and it would get, get into the river. The ones on the bottom are outside the flood zone. So they're just essentially isolated features. They were not jurisdictional. Okay. This gra graph on the left is an impoundment that was built in a perennial stream which flows all the way to the river, okay? There's no pipe, there's no nothing. It's just built in that perennial stream. That would be jurisdictional, even under new rules. The next one was a relic tributary. So it really wasn't, it was more like an ephemeral stream or, or an area where a tributary was moved. Um, the lake was built there. There's also a block, and I'm assuming that's probably a berm there that was built that keeps water from getting into the river. So that's not jurisdictional. Over here is a man-made ditch in Uplands and you've got a pond on it. So that's not gonna be jurisdictional either or it wasn't under the Trump rule. Then you've got another one over here that was built in an ephemeral stream. We're expecting ephemeral streams not to be jurisdictional as well. So this would no longer be jurisdictional. Okay, then, then over here, you've got a perennial stream. You've got an impoundment. You've got another impoundment. So because those impoundments were built in that perennial stream, even though they're similarly situated, they would be jurisdictional. Then over here, you've got, and this is a question. You've got a pond that was built in a perennial stream, but then you've got a pipe that goes from the perennial stream into the river. No one knows if that's going to be jurisdictional or not right now. So that's what we have to wait and see. Then you have an impoundment of non-waters of the U.S. in an ephemeral stream. That's not going to be jurisdictional We because it's an ephemeral stream. And up here to the right, this one is a different one. This was a pond that was built in a perennial stream. However, the perennial stream goes away and it's an ephemeral stream that goes into this other pond that flows into the, the river. It's not gonna be jurisdictional because the ephemeral stream disconnects jurisdiction. And then you've got an impoundment here that was built in a ephemeral stream above, non-jurisdictional. Then it flows down into a perennial stream at the point that the ephemeral 
becomes perennial, then this pond will become jurisdictional. And these are wetlands that abut. If you'll notice, there's four different wetlands here. None of them touch this water at all, even though they're close, within close proximity, but they don't touch the water. So they're non-jurisdictional because they have to be touching. And then you have the four features down at the bottom that actually touch the river or the pond. This is a pond that is on the river. So, but they're all touching this feature. So they would all be jurisdictional. And this is, this is a picture that's been around a long time. It shows you the limits of section 404 of the Clean Water Act, mean high tide, section 10 waters, and, and everyone knows that section 10 waters are navigable waters. 404 are waters of the US and wetlands. So this is the section 10. This is tidal waters. These are freshwater, section 404. Section 10 stops at the ordinary high water mark. 404 goes until the wetlands end right here. Okay. The Supreme Court did not address natural or artificial barriers. The assumption is that if it's not directly connected, then it's not going to be jurisdictional. Um, the, the wetland has to have a continuous surface connection. I'm, I'm, I know I'm beating this in your head, but it's, that's what the Supreme Court says, a continuous surface connection to that water, making it difficult for you to determine where the water ends and where the wetland begins. Okay, and here's another scenario with your river. You've got a culvert going from the river underneath the road into a jurisdictional wet, wetland. So there is a direct hydrologic connection, but are they gonna call it jurisdictional or not? That's what we've got to see. And then, this is a, another culvert going into the river and it doesn't flood. So there's not a surface connection from flooding. So we don't know if that's gonna be jurisdictional or not. And then this one lacks any kind of surface connection at all. So it, we are assuming it's going to be non-jurisdictional. Whereas today or six months ago, it would have been determined adjacent and the core would have required a permit to fill this wetland. Okay, the core does, we're skipping over now to jurisdictional determinations. We're kind of getting into the state of the way things are right now. Um, the core didn't have to do make jurisdictional determinations for the public. It was just a service to the public, okay? Um, so they haven't been doing that lately because of the craziness with the rule. So they will not issue a jurisdictional determination right now unless it is for uplands only. So if you have a project that you want to work on, that you have wetlands associated with that project, you're not gonna to touch them, you're only gonna work in the uplands, the core will give you a determination right now. So keep that in mind. Um, also, they, there are nationwide permits that have um, limits on them, less than half an acre. And some of them don't require pre-construction notification. So providing you're in compliance with the, the conditions on that permit, you can go ahead and do the work. But if you have a nationwide permit that has 
wetland fill, then my suggestion to you is you submit a wetland delineation with your nationwide permit and make absolutely certain that you have complied with all the conditions of that permit and your application is complete, then the core has 30 days to tell you if that application is complete or not. If you do not hear from the core, then you assume that your application is complete. Then at the end of 45 days, the core has to, to tell you your, your permit's been issued. If they don't tell you anything at all, then you can go ahead with your work. However, what you need to know is you have got to be in compliance with the conditions and it's always considered proceed at your own risk. So if you have a project that would fit a nationwide permit, then you need to consult with somebody if you have not heard anything from the Corps within 45 days and you need to keep your files up to date showing that you have completed everything that the regulation requires you to complete in order to do the work. The last information we've gotten from EPA and from USACE was June the 26th and 27th, when they let everybody know that they are working on a new rule. And what they told us at that time was we expect to have the final rule out by September the 1st. Um, that's probably going to be pretty hard for them to do because we've not heard anything from them recently. And the, the rule will have to be on public notice for 60 days. So it won't be September the 1st because they've missed the 60 days um, pretty much. So, but they are trying to fast track it. Everyone I spoke to says they're working as hard as they can to get this done. Um, and we've been told that the lawsuits will continue. So that's, that's the way of the world. The Supreme Court determined that the significant nexus is unconstitutional. Uh, current waters rule is on hold in most states. And the current rule, of course, was the Biden rule. So you can still get a permit, but it will be based on Rapanos and pre-2015 regulations. Um, AJDs are on hold in most districts, except for Upland AJDs. And an AJD is an approved jurisdictional determination. You can still get preliminary jurisdictional determinations if you want to just say, yes, I have wetlands on my property and this is where I think they're located. The core will review that for you if you want them to. Um, personally, I like AJDs. Um, you say some EPA will abide by whatever the Supreme Court decision is. So they're working on a future rule that will take into consideration everything that the Supreme Court has said. And in my thought, that is going to make the regulations much more lax. They will, they will not be um, as controlling as they are currently. I have felt for many years that the government has overstepped their boundaries and as many people have. And this new rule, I truly believe, is going to make a difference while still providing protection to our resources. Um, we've got question and answers. I did want, I missed one thing. I had a public service announcement and that was there's um, college football kickoff is in 45 days, roll tide. So if y'all have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. And you're welcome to email me. You're welcome to give me a call. There's my information. And thank you for joining us today. Cindy, one of the questions that came in is, can you address intermittent stream connections? 
Okay, and intermittent stream connections. Um, if an intermittent stream today, intermittent streams are jurisdictional, okay? Um, there has been discussion that EPA and the Corps may remove intermittent streams from the regulations, but there's got to, if we don't know right now, and um, it, it depends on the flow of the intermittent streams um, and the seasonally. Uh, there are so many different things, and I fully believe that intermittent streams are going to continue to be jurisdictional, but you know, we, we don't know that answer right now. I, I am absolutely certain that ephemeral streams will no longer be jurisdictional. Um, I think the intermittent streams will determine, will be determined on whether they're, they're running through wetlands, um, if they are truly seasonal streams. Um, there, there are just so many caveats that are gonna have to be reviewed by EPA and the Corps to make that determination. But most of the people I've spoken to don't want to think about if intermittent streams going away. Any other questions? Please just type, okay, here we go. I know it's out of our regions, but does this apply to the pothole region, either through the Migratory Bird Act or Interstate Commerce Act? It, it, yes, um, the pothole region is going to be um, something that we stand a chance of losing all those pothole wetlands because of any kind of new rules. And the, the federal government is trying to push that regulatory authority down to the states so they will actually be able to manage those type areas. Um, and if you recall, during um, the years ago when, when we did the um, isolated wetland rulemaking, migratory birds was taken out of it. So they did not even look at migratory birds during the um, that Northern Cook County lawsuit. So, um, I would say that the prairie potholes will definitely be looked at by the state instead of the federal agencies. Okay, we have another one, Cindy. Will the Corps issue permits for speculative site development? No, plain and simple, no. If, if you do not have a project plan, when you submit your permit application, the, the Corps is going to send it back to you, or they're going to call you and say, hey, you got to tell me what your plan is for this. They, they do not look at speculative development at all. Speculative development like community industrial parks where the specific end user is not known. That was a follow-up. A follow Okay, in the past, the Corps would look at projects for industrial development, business parks and things of that nature, industrial parks, but that was many years ago and they just won't do it. Now, what you do have an option though, you can actually submit a plan to do work, you know, it, like, over a 10 year period or over a 15 year period or, or whatever, you can submit a master plan and say, this is what our plan is. And then at the time you get to develop that site because you have a client to develop the site for, then you already have a permitting mechanism in place, but they will not allow you to go in and fill a wetland regardless of the reason and then build it and say, they will come. They won't allow you to do that. Okay, Cindy, what do I do with a determination that was recent, but is a wetland near an intermittent stream? I would hold it and wait till the new is, and I'm assuming this is what you're asking, if the regulations change, um, just 
resubmit. You can withdraw that request if it has not been responded to by the core, or if it has, and the regulations change and the intermittent stream is no longer jurisdictional, then you submit another request and ask for a new JD call. Okay, do you have any thoughts on future litigation, what that might include? I have no idea what that might include. And to be honest with you, once the new rule comes out, there may not be any litigation. So the, everything is kind of held up waiting on seeing what the new rule is going to say. Okay, why would the presence of the culvert prevent the perennial stream connection from being considered jurisdictional, but would allow the wetland area on the other side of the roadway to be considered jurisdictional? In both instances, direct hydrologic surface connection exists, but one is not considered jurisdictional. Right, and I, and I would think this, that the stream did not run through the wetland on the other side of the road. You have a wetland, and then on the north side of the road, you have a perennial stream. I'm assuming that that perennial stream did not run through the wetland. That So the pipe actually severed the connection, the continuous surface water connection. So that's the only thing I could think of was that it... Um, it was no longer the road severed the connection as well as the pipe. And it was not considered a continuous surface water connection. And it depends, and let me, let me give you some insight on that. When we first changed um, the regulations back in 2008, that was one of the questions um, at that time, is a pipe gonna sever the connection? So, you know, and, and the, the thought came up, well, does the pipe have to be 20 feet long, 50 feet long, 30 feet long? There were so many different caveats to that question. Um, and there, Rapanos, of course, was allowed for adjacency. This does not. So it's, it's going to be a case-by-case -case situation, I'm pretty sure. Okay, uh, we'll give one more minute just as a, uh, to let everybody know um, when we have an update on this in September, we will have another TTL Insights event to share with you. And if you registered, um, those people that registered that you're attending here, we will send you that information and invite so you can sign up for that. We'll reach out to you. Um, we'll also follow this event up with um, letting you know where you can see the recording should you want to re-review it, share it with anybody. Um, and we encourage you if you have any questions, um, reach out to your TTL contact and you can reach out to Cindy House Pearson here. Cindy, I don't see any other questions. Um, but if you want to go ahead and, and close us out, um, we'll um, say to, until next time. Okay. Thank you again, everyone, for attending. And we'll talk soon.